All right, so um, today is our final question session of this, um, this season of the winter. So um, thanks everybody who showed up with us um, for the last three sessions and thanks for everybody who's showing up today. Um, today we're going to be talking about mating disruption. We have two, three actually speakers today, which I'm really excited about. And first we're going to pass it over to Tracy Lesky. Tracy is with the USDA and the Appala Appalachian Fruit Research Station. And um, she's going to be talking today and joined by her postdoc, I believe, right? Laura Nixon. So excited to see you guys talk. Great, thank you, Janet. Um, let me make sure I'm sharing my screen appropriately. Uh, are we good? That looks great. Okay, so um, today Laura and I are gonna talk about uh, scalable mating disruption. Can we make it work? And so, um, and this was born out of me going down a rabbit hole a couple of years ago, trying to understand um, you know, how these recommendations were made. What was the data that was used to generate them um, in terms of just applying mating disruption? So, um, and when, what we're gonna talk about today, we're gonna just really focus on two of our key lepidopteran pests, both coddling moth and OFM. Um, obviously we know these are fruit feeders burrowing into um, developing fruit, making, products unrender unrenderable for the market, especially with live larvae being found. So um, when we start talking about mating disruption, there are a number of requirements that are generally raised to ensure that mating disruption is um, uh, successful. These include um, orchards that are um, isolated from non-mating disruption plots or wild hosts to avoid dispersal of mated females. The borders are vulnerable to depletion of pheromone concentrations by wind, so they should not be long and skinny. And orchards should have flat topography and be comprised of small trees, square in shape, and at least a hectare in size. Um, so if we look across uh, recommendations that you'll find in extension guides, in general, the most common uh, recommendation we came across were that plots needed to be at least five acres. Um, there were a few that said smaller, like three acres, and then some referred to um, 10 acre plots, even larger. Now, in the East, we have many growers that have farms that really have trouble meeting all of these criteria. And so, um, Again, this is why I kind of went down the rabbit hole and I wanted to look for the information that was used to generate those, um, those recommendations. And so what I found was uh, that generally speaking, these are the three references that are most commonly cited for coddling moth mating disruption, which seems to be the basis for which all mating disruption is built. So um, Charmelot in 1990, uh, this is where um, the orchard should be greater than three hectares. Now, this these data, uh, which it's not really um, very clear what the data are, but they were generated in Switzerland in the 1980s, so a long time ago. So, you know, obviously production systems have continued to evolve. Another reference is uh, the Thompson et al. 1999. This one is really a review article. Um, there's no new data in there. And then um, the concern over mated females dispersing into blocks. This came from a paper generated by Alan Knight back in 1995. Um, these data were actually not based on female flight distances, but it was based on an estimate using what I'm gonna show you next, which is a kind of a complicated picture, but I just wanna show you what where these data come from. So, um, the way this study worked, they were doing different types of mating disruption treatments. And then they thought they might have might see a pattern in these small blocks that I'm circling. And what they assumed were all female moths, mated female moths, were coming from this A1 block here. And that the proportion of trees with injured fruit in these blocks, 6, 10, 11, and 12, which all had 2,000 dispensers per hectare, this was the treatment they were using, were used then to estimate um, rates of injury across this transect. And so what they found was 50% of the trees with greater than zero injuries, so you know anything above zero, were about 225 meters from the edge of this A1 block. And those that had greater than four 
um, injured fruit per tree were 75 meters. So what they did is they made a range 75 to 225, and then they added the center of that block to uh, to the distance to the center of that block to that estimate to come up with 275 to 425 meters. My concern with this, again, is just that female moth dispersal was not measured directly. And um, who's to say they weren't coming from all these other directions? So anyway, that's, like I said, I went down a rabbit hole. So this kind of led to this question that Laura and I have been addressing over the last couple of years. Um, can we develop scalable mating disruption practices? And so I'm gonna take the first question and then Laura's gonna talk about the second question. The first question is really what tools are available for moder monitoring cuddling moth and OFM? Are there differences in commercially available lure quality in terms of attractiveness and sensitivity? And then Laura's gonna tackle how well does mating disruption work in non-compliant blocks. In other words, blocks that don't meet those very um, restrictive requirements and looking for a more scalable approach. So um, with the products and, and the question I'm gonna talk about, there are many products available when you go on um, websites. And so what I always say, please, please, please follow your extension recommendations um, because you know different products can behave differently. And as part of this, we decided to look at both coddling moth and OFM and look at different um, lure formulations that were out there to try to determine if there were these differences in, track, in attractiveness and sensitivity. So for coddling moth, we know what the major sex pheromone is, referred to as coddlemone. And then there are some caramones, some plant-based volatiles that sometimes are used, including what is referred to as the pear ester, acetic acid, and alpha farnesine. Now, in terms of monitoring, typically uh, uh, the sex pheromone lures are used um, and with a threshold of five moths per trap per week to trigger any necessary applications at a two-week interval. And then these pear ester and some of these other um, um, caramones are often combined with a pheromone um, to be used to monitor mating disruption blocks. So what we did was to start with just the pheromone lure and look at all the available products that were out there that had similar um, levels of longevity. And uh, uh, and then what we did was to deploy these out in the field. So for the coddling moth pheromone, we looked at Century, Trace, Alpha Sense, and ISCA Technologies lures, all ranging, you know, on average about six weeks of activity when they needed to be changed. But these these were deployed in delta traps in the upper third of the canopy, and the traps and treatments were re-randomized every week, and the lures were changed. And we did this season long in three commercial plots with three reps per plot. And so what did we find? Well, it was interesting. So uh, Century and Trace had the significantly more attractive lures than the control, but Isca and Alpha Sense were similar. But... If you look at the seasonal phenology and this five moths per trap per week threshold, you can see that in some cases, some traps probably hit that threshold, or I should say some pheromone lure beta traps probably hit that threshold pretty well, and others could miss it. And so this is just something, again, reminding folks about the need to ensure that you're using what is being recommended by uh, local extension. Um, we also wanted to look at these um, plant-based um, lures that are in combination with pheromone because, you know, a lot of people talk about the fact that they're probably not attractive to eastern populations of calling moth. So we had four treatments that we went out with, Trace DA, which is just the plant-based caramone, Trace Ferricon CMDA, which has the pheromone plus the caramone, and then the Alpha Sense caramone and an unbated control. And again, these went out in commercial plots. We had uh, the, the traps in the upper third of the canopy, re-randomized, the lures were changed according to the recommendations of the company. And again, we did this season long. And so in this case, what we found was very little attraction to the, the caramone. So the Alpha Sense, which is just the caramone, and the Trace ADA, which is just the caramone, captured a few moths, but not a lot. Um, and the CMDA, which had the pheromone in there, seemed to be driven, the captures were probably driven by the presence of the pheromone. So again, this Eastern populations probably are not responsive to this caramone stimulus. So that's important 
if um, someone were to try to use it to say, look at um, efficacy of mating disruption, this is probably something they should steer clear of. And then finally, we looked at OFM and available lures as well and with the three component lure. Um, it's interesting, most lures are actually at a different ratio than what is described in the literature, but it seems to work. And so we just wanted to again, see if there were differences among commercially available lures. And so we had five treatments, Century, Trace, Isca, and AlphaSense, an unbated control. And again, we did these um, traps. Um, they were re-randomized every two weeks. The lures changed according to the recommendations from the company. And again, all done in commercial plots, three plots with three reps per plot, season long. And in this case, what we found was... Um, there were some significant differences among the treatments with ISCA being more attractive than Century, Trace, or the Alpha Sense lure. Now, we had very low captures throughout the season. Um, with a threshold of 10 moths per trap per week, we were much lower than that threshold. So I don't, we don't know if these would be triggering sprays at the right time, but we're going to be repeating these, these studies again just to be sure. And I think I'm at the point where I'm going to pass it to Laura. So we're going to we're going to jump seats here. So let me. Well, do you want that seat? Uh, sure. Okay. Yeah. yeah. This seat. Okay. Hello. Um, okay. So I'm going to talk about the uh, second key question here, which is how well can we make mate mating disruption work in what we're calling these non-compliant blocks? So. Um, just briefly to kind of describe, I'm sure all of you are pretty familiar with main disruption, but just to describe how it's working and how we're doing it, there are a lot of different products available for mating disruption. In all of the trials that I'm going to talk about, we use the Isomate Coddling Moth OFM Twin Tubes, which are these little tie dispensers that you go and put in your individual trees. So um, the way that this works is those dispensers have um, long-lasting, slow-release um, pheromone for each species there. So this is the female released pheromone. So basically you put the dispensers up in your apple trees. You feel moth, female moths are hanging out waiting for the males to find them. But because these dispensers create a pheromone plume throughout the orchard, the, oh, where's my clicky? The males come along and it very much disrupts their flight pattern and they're not able to find the females within the orchard. So they don't reproduce actually within your orchards. Um, so all of the um, blocks that we did these studies in were research apple blocks here on our station. Um, and all of these blocks were non-uniform blocks. They're all less than one acre, um, non-uniform trees. Some of them are long and skinny. They are not isolated from other blocks or from tree lines. So these are our non-compliant blocks. So in 2022, we did our initial mating disruption in non-compliant blocks trial. So what we did here is in April, we deployed mating disruption ties in four of our experimental blocks. Um, four blocks received just grower standard spray programs as per the Mid-Atlantic um, Fruit Growers Guide. Um, and then four of our blocks had no treatment for arthropod pests at all. So we had complete controls there. Again, all of these blocks are non-compliant. Um, and then we just left this out for the season. We had monitoring traps in each of these blocks just to look at the background um, pest pressure for coddling moth and OFM. And in September, we harvested fruit and evaluated it for injury from both of these species. And this is what we found in terms of fruit injury at harvest time. Um, you can see that the mating disruption blocks um, did have decreased damage compared to no spray control blocks, but those grower standard insecticide spray blocks had the lowest damage and they had very, very low damage around 2% of fruit with any damage on them. Um, but this is showing that mating disruption is doing something in these non-compliant blocks. It is reducing that injury. Um, we then saw for uh, OFM that although the mating disruption blocks had numerically reduced damage, it wasn't actually significant. Um, and that, of course, those growth standard blocks had very, very low damage in them. So when we look at our background trap captures um, for the 2022 season, um, you can see for we split it up into blocks that had no spray control, grower standard and the mating disruption only. So you can see for coddling moths in those mating disruption blocks, we had very, very low capture all year. 
Um, and for OFM, we had low capture that kind of increased. So when we overlay those um, thresholds that Tracy mentioned in the earlier part of the talk, um, you can see that in these no spray control blocks, um, the trap captures were hitting that five moths per trap per week threshold, but the mating disruption blocks weren't despite um, uh, despite having that increased damage compared to the grower standards. And then we kind of see the same thing for OFM over the season. Um, what we do see for OFM is actually right here at the late season in kind of early August, we see this sudden increase in trap captures in the mating disruption blocks. And this may explain some of that damage that we saw on the fruit. Um, we're getting this late season damage. So I went back and looked really carefully at the isomate label and actually found that although it is designed for both species, it is designed for coddling moth season long, but it is actually only designed for OFM for 90 days. And that 90 days where it runs out hits about where our trap captures start to go up. So we wanted to fix that in the following year. So in 2023, we really wanted to refine this and try and make this work for us. So um, I had this idea of integrating threshold-based sprays with the mating disruption. Um, that way we can use mating disruption, hopefully decrease the amount of insecticide spray going out and protect the fruit. Um, so let's see if this was effective. So um, we wanted to know if existing threshold recommendations for non-mating disruption blocks would work. So again, that's five codling moth or 10 oriental fruit moth per trap per week or if we should look at a different threshold um, when combining it with mating disruption. Um, and make sure that we have effective tools for easy implementation of this protocol. We also wanted to supplement that OFM mating disruption at the 90 day point to negate some of that late season damage that we saw. So our setup for 2023 is basically, we had um, our we had four blocks of grower standard insecticide sprays once again, we had four blocks that only had mating disruption deployed in them once again. And then we had um, this one block that had mating disruption deployed and we checked our monitoring traps every week. And if there was either two codling moth or five OFM in those monitoring traps, we would spray that week. We're calling these our experimental thresholds based off of last year's background data. And then we had four blocks that had mating disruption in and then the extension recommended thresholds. So if there was five coddling moth or 10 OFM in those traps, we would spray on top of that. Um, and in July, we redeployed just OFM mating disruption to try and negate that late season damage there. And once again, we harvested fruit in September and checked it for injury. So we actually found that by integrating mating disruption with these threshold based sprays, we could reduce both coddling moth and OFM injury up to five times compared to just the mating disruption alone. Um, so as you can see for both coddling moth and oriental fruit moth, that the um, fruit injury level was um, not different from the grower standard when we had mating disruption in there with sprays um, at either of the thresholds, both the extension recommended of five coddling moth 10 OFM or the experimental threshold that we came up with of two and five. Um, we also found quite a lot of live larvae at harvest time this year, showing how high our pressure really was. Um, so we actually had live larvae in every block, um, regardless of um, treatment, but the, the numbers were much, much lower in both the grower standards and both of those threshold and main disruption uh, treatment blocks. And then when we look at the um, trap captures, so for coddling moth, we used, rather than using that chiromone law that Tracy talked about, because we didn't find it very effective, we used these 10x laws, which is the pheromone law, but 10 times concentrated to make it more attractive. Um, these were used for monitoring and our coddling, oh, apologies, and our coddling moth pressure was fairly high in mating disruption only blocks. Um, and these mating disruption only blocks did not receive any form of spray throughout the entire season. Um, so you can see how many times that they were hitting this low threshold of two or this high threshold of five. Um, and then for OFM, we actually, it's recommended for um, for OFM mating disruption to just use a single normal OFM lure, um, which we were a little bit dubious about because we're um, not really sure what's going on with these non-compliant blocks. We actually ended up just stringing together five laws to make our own homemade 5X lore um, for this. 
Um, and you can see we had really, really low OFM pressure this year, and that lines up with what Tracy spoke about. Um, so the threshold sprays that we put on were actually never triggered by OFM. They were only triggered by coddling moth each time. Um, and then looking at how many sprays went on each of these treatment blocks, um, mating disruption plus threshold sprays actually reduced the insecticide applications over 50% compared to the grower standards. So grower standard and both threshold treatments received um, uh, one petal fall spray, and then the grower standard got eight cover sprays since it was quite a long season last year. And our threshold 2.5 and threshold 5.10 blocks had their petal fall spray plus one to two threshold triggered sprays. We think that petal fall spray is really helping out with those early season um, populations here. Um, so this is really good news. Um, so what we're really taking away from this is that um, with those commercially available lures, trap captures can vary among lure types and could be, affected by, uh, could be affecting your management outcomes. We can actually make mating disruption work in non-compliant orchard blocks when we combine it with other IPM tactics. And by triggering insecticide applications using both the experimental and standard threshold, we were able to um, protect fruit from damage and also reduce insecticide applications by over 50%. Um, and then those sort of OFM thresholds, either our monitoring laws need to be improved for those, and we've had some advice off of other people of better laws to use this year, um, or we need to be setting a lower OFM thresholds depending on what the populations look like this year. Um, so for future directions, um, the law comparison trials will be repeated again in 2024. Um, we will be repeating this uh, mating disruption with threshold sprays in our research blocks again in 2024. We'll also be identifying larv live larvae to see which species they come from because we were just picking it generally as live larvae this year, uh, last year. Um, we'll also actually, we have some commercial farms that are willing to work with us. Um, they like the look of this data. So we do have one grower in Maryland that is going to do... Um, the test the threshold, the main disruption plus threshold sprays in his orchard to see how it does because he's having really high coddling moth pressure at the moment. Um, we also want to actually quantify the dispersal capacity of gravid females. Um, so we've done a preliminary um, study just uh, basically marking female coddling moth with this fluorescent powder um, as pictured here. Basically, you can release them into the orchard and go back and track them with UV flashlights. Um, so we're looking to do some of that this year to see how far they actually will fly into orchard blocks and quantify that. Um, we are also part of a uh, proposal for an Eastern Tree Fruit SCRI um, with uh, researchers and extension folk up and down the East Coast. Um, and we're looking at improving phenology models, degree days, traps, and uh, things like mating disruption as well. So with that, we would both like to um, acknowledge our wonderful lab group that, that works so hard on this stuff and take questions. We're both still here, so. Yeah. Stop sharing. Mm -hmm. See what I don't think I want to proceed. Excellent. Thank you guys both. Um, that was really good. I feel like I need to listen to that whole thing like five more times to really understand it all. <clears throat> um, I do have a couple questions. I don't know. I guess we're pretty informal group here. So if anybody um has any questions, you can unmute and ask. And I'll let you guys all get a chance to jump in first before I start firing all my questions at them. Yeah, is it so, what what is your sense of how far? I mean, do you just have any any kind of seat of the pants idea of how far these gravid females do fly? I, I kind of imprinted on the work we did with Ron Prokopy way back when, where it was kind of a hundred meter, you know, distance, and I'm not sure where he pulled that out of, but it's how far he cut the trees down, Kathleen. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's which, true. That was a spectacularly <laughs> unsuccessful. <laughs> <laughs> Although it did, I mean, we had zero spray all summer long, you know, right. after the fall, and we had no coddling moth injury, which was kind of, I mean, I don't know how to explain that. <laughs> we did see some lesser apple worm, but but basically never never coddling moth, and you know, it's it's become. I I I was just kind of shocked at the distance that that Alan Knight paper was, you know, listing for how far they would they would fly. So we did do some preliminary work um a couple of seasons ago, which we're going to carry on this year. Like I say, we were marking females and releasing them up to 200 metres away from the orchard. 
um, and then going back and tracking them. And we found that most of the females that we found in the orchard had come from less than 50 meters away. Um, and only really like, I think one came from 200 meters away and that was it. Um, but again, that's very preliminary data. So we're um, we're going to be doing a lot more replicates of that in different, it also depends on weather types and that kind of thing and more complex environments. So yeah. we're, we're, we're working on that part, yeah. Okay, thank you. We do have a question, Jeremy, I see you popped up here. No, I am also just trying to kind of process all of this. I mean, I was just going through some of my lures that I have in storage. Like, do I have the right one? What, what do I have to do? <laughs> and so, yeah, just kind of head spinning as far as what I should use. But you do have me thinking that I should probably play around with um, different concentrations of the lures this year and at least kind of pay attention to that and see what our, our capture rates are. Well, um, Jeremy, one thing, you know, and whomever your local folks are, generally they're thresholds are calibrated for a particular brand so it's good to check in with them um we were just i we wanted to take a broad brush stroke and see how things looked and there was enough of a difference and we did other elect pests as well there was enough of a difference that it's really important just to make sure you're following whatever recommendations are local because yeah you could have very different outcomes depending on the brand you throw in your trap yeah definitely good to bring to our attention thank yeah. you yeah, kind of following up on that, that actually brings up one of my questions, which was if I'm understanding correctly. So this is something that I've been hugely confused about and and not gotten a great straight answer from the chem companies is, you know, in those mating disruption blocks, what is the best lure to use and um and going back and forth between the combo and the 10x. And from I think my understanding of the data that you just presented, it sounds like the combo is really not giving me anything beyond just that normal L2. So maybe in our region, the, the 10X is the best option. Is that correct or am I mis misunderstanding what you said? Yeah, so from making disruption blocks, we use the 10X rather than the combo based off of the, you know, the data that Tracy presented with the combo one. Um, and we we got decent captures using the 10x with mating disruption. And so. and most people aren't using the combo so much in the east, only because, and Amy probably can speak to this too in Michigan, but nobody's seen really good response to that those caramonal stimuli in those combo lures. Now in the west, they do, they see it, but it's like we have host races or something that they're just less attractive to the moss. So the pheromone, the 10x lure is. <laughs> yeah well following up i'm going to just keep the question time until somebody else unmutes um so another question i had was um so it looked like you had sort of those two different treatments where you were using a threshold on top of the mating disruption to to you know have a, a secondary spray and from the data that I was seeing, it looks like they're basically kind of equivalent, which was really surprising to me that even the number of sprays that you were using in those two treatments seemed like they were basically the same. So based on that, do you have a recommendation? If if I was talking to a grower and they were interested in following up on this with their own program, what would you recommend that they use <laughs> as that threshold? Um, so we've only done, this is just our first year of data on it. Um, so we'll be repeating this exactly the same this year. The um, grower that we're working with, we're going with the conservative lower captures, um, just because it's our first time doing it on a commercial basis. So, um, But the, the thing I think that both, whether you had the higher threshold or the lower threshold, they were hitting the peak times. And so it didn't matter. That's probably more or less why we didn't see a difference. I mean, you know, when when populations were high, both of those thresholds were triggering at the same time. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it kind of seemed like I was the person checking the traps every week, and it very much seemed like there was either moths or there wasn't moths. So I think that's why. Yeah. <laughs> and we just we lowered it based on what we saw the previous year, and it's interesting. Um, as all all the tree fruit entomologists in the east, we just had a meeting on. Monday, uh, Laura described the SCRI proposal that we're working on, and everybody talked about those thresholds. <laughs> you know, it's really just a good guess. I see Art's on. Maybe he can tell us otherwise. <laughs> if it's a good guess or there's data out there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, uh, 
Hi, hi, Tracy. Hi, Laura. Hi, Dan, everybody. I don't know if I am I am I showing up there. Possibly. Yeah. Well, yeah. anyway, it's very nice to see some familiar faces and to hear uh, this great research going on. A once familiar topic. <laughs> I haven't had a lot of uh, <laughs> opportunity to get into it, but uh, yeah, I would uh, I would corroborate your um, your assessment of the threshold, so called. I mean, we we basically have always been flying kind of blind. Uh, when it comes to uh, thresholds for these two levels, well, most of them really, uh, mm -hmm. just because, you know, you're dealing with um, male moths and you know, there's always a, a uncertainty how that uh, actually translates into the actual female population and the, and the egg laying potential and all that. So it's, uh, it's, it's not a bad rule of thumb, you know, to, to follow because it, it tells you, it's probably a, a an upper bound, you know, you, you don't want it to get much higher than that before you start paying attention to the numbers. But I would never take it, I, I would take it with a grain of salt always, you know, because it shows that the, the, the moths are out there and active. And, um, you know, it's it's a place to start. Yeah, that was what we all were talking about, Art, and sort of like best educated guess um, um, based on years of experience. And so, um, anyway, it was a, it was a long discussion about that on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Well, I, I would, uh, I just wanted to um, uh, give my, uh, um, uh, uh, I, I'm impressed and uh, and encouraged to see that you're uh, striking out into these non-compliant orchards, because that's really always been one of the roadblocks mm -hmm. uh, to, you know, adoption of mating disruption as a more widespread uh, tactic, is that Many, many plantings are just not, you know, the ideal size and shape and whatever other characteristics you would like to have for mating disruption. So it's great to have some uh, rudimentary guidelines, um, you know, for using mating disruption in those in those size and shape plantings, those those non-compliant. So, yeah, I, I uh, uh, yeah, I, I compliment you on your on your research direction there. That's a good <laughs> idea. <laughs> Good to see you, Art. Same here. Keep up the good work. I, ha I actually have a follow-up question kind of about the non-compliant blocks. I apologize if you already answered this. I was driving for the beginning, but were they all similar in their non-compliance? Were they all long and skinny or small acreage or were they really different? And do you feel like the results that you're seeing are going to be the same for different kinds of non-compliance or do you think it's going to be different? Yeah. So in the study on our research block, it's uh, in our research plots, they're all non-compliant in quite similar ways. They're all relatively square, a little skinnier than you would have them, small, some missing trees, that kind of general stuff. Um, that's why we're really excited to go to have commercial orchards work with us um, because they have like long, skinny blocks. Um, they have blocks on very weird hilltops and that kind of thing. Um, so we're hoping that by having these partnerships, we're, we're able to explore more different kinds of non-compliance. Yeah, but that's a that's definitely on our minds, Anna. Yeah. Another follow up question on that is I saw you were using like the twist ties. Um, I don't know. You probably said exactly what brand and like the rate for those twist ties. Was that one of the like 500, the larger or 300 or something per acre? Those are um, 200 per acre for the, uh, so it's the isomate ones, and their highest label rate for the twin tubes is um, 200 per acre with a doubling around the edge. Um, and then for the OFM alone ones, it's actually, I believe, 300 per acre recommended on the label. So we went with the higher label rate simply because we're using non-compliant blocks and we wanted to give it sort of a good the chance. chance we yeah. could at least, yeah. Okay, so um, I guess a follow up on that is we've been looking at some of the lower rate options up here, like the Trace has one that's super low, you know, like 32 per acre, um, which I think is a, a great selling point for growers in terms of a lot less labor, but I'm a little bit leery if that might be then less likely to work in the non-compliant blocks. Obviously, you probably haven't done research on that, but I'm wondering if you have any gut, gut feelings on Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not it's not a product we've we've tried as of yet. Um, so it's we're, probably yeah. we're hoping these kinds of questions going forward and um, with some of our colleagues as well that are interested in trying some of this. So hopefully we'll have more for you. Jan. Yeah, let's do something.
Yeah. Um, if nobody else has any questions, I can just keep going. Coming back to, um, I think it was really great. It was a, a nice little reality check that I also get really hung up on these thresholds and I sort of view them, sometimes I get into the habit of viewing them as the word of God and that, you know, monitoring trap, trap catch numbers should directly correlate to damage seen. And obviously that's not how it works. And I've been a little bit frustrated by that recently in some of the blocks that I've been looking at. Um, so that's a great reality check. I really appreciate hearing both you and Art sort of giving me the, like, these are our best guess, you know, these are, you know, the model is, is useful, but it's not necessarily entirely accurate. But with that in mind, I'm still wondering, um, so with the OFM, you guys were saying in those mating disruption blocks that you strung five lures together, which I love the ingenuity. I like the idea of it, but I'm wondering if that's something that would be worth bringing to some of those companies and suggesting to them that OFM, like a 10X OFM lure would be a really great product um, that we need to see, or is that not really worth so we've since been advised, we've had a couple of companies see us sort of present this and, and other extension folk, um, and they've, um, is it the, what's it called? The in, it's Tracy's Lure. I yeah, think. Enhanced, is that the word? Some, but yeah. Apparently there is a better OFM Lure available now. Or mating this Yeah. Yeah. I believe last spring when we spoke with a lot of these people, it was still in testing um, phase, kind of on the West Coast. So it's now like an available product. Yeah. So. We'll be using that going forward to see how that goes. Mm -hmm. And if I could just jump in here, I, I recall from past conversations that um, uh, 5X or 10X lures of other species other than cattling moth are not necessarily uh, more attractive because uh, the biology of those moths is that they tend to get sort of more repressed or suppressed Rated. by higher concentrations of their pheromone. It, it works, yeah, Kylie moth is a strange animal in that, you know, you really can uh, draw more with it with a 10X lure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've, I've got a question to kind of throw out there. This is something that um, I've been scratching my head on for a little bit, you know, we have, we have the we have NUA and we have a bunch of weather stations all over the place and we have our coddling moth model and we have some growers that are kind of um I mean they're they're certainly monitoring or, or we're helping them monitor. So some of them have kind of adopted this practice of timing coddling moth, egg hatch, and trying to use BT and really nail that really well, you know. Um and just thinking about that you know, in contrast with also monitoring and seeing like we're, I've been seeing kind of a, a fairly distinct peak in that, that first flight, but then this long drawn out um, flight for a large portion of the remainder of the season. Um, and so there's, there's all of that coupled with conversations that we're having right now with NRCS um, and some of their IPM programs that support those and Anna uh, Wallace has been a part of those in New York. But trying to think about this, this is all so interesting with scalable, you know, mating disruption. NRC, we have NRCS's ear. We have a NUA. Um, and just trying to figure out with these growers that fall kind of in that, that smaller range of smaller acreage, um, how to get them started with mating disruption best and like a place to jump in that we're comfortable with, you know. Yeah. Yeah, so Jeremy, one of the things that like this project that we're working on, this SCRI group, what we want to do is try to develop, you know, and again, it's going to be based on everybody's experience, but trying to get at, you know, um, better understanding what constitutes a high population density, a moderate population density, and a low population density, and what tools make the most sense under current conditions with the current materials we have and what we're seeing because you know we we talk about we've talked about this a lot you know locally when everybody was hammering brown marmorated stink bug with every pyrethroid under the sun 
we we saw less pest pressure in some cases from some insects, but now that a lot of that's been dialed back and we're back with people trying to go back to some of the LEP specific materials mating disruption, we're seeing more. And then weird springs, right? Every every spring is weird. And so all of that is leading to uncertainty that I think we just have to kind of sort through based on where we are right now and with the production systems and the products we have right now. I know that's not an answer, but I concur. I guess it's me <laughs> okay, saying. Okay, good, good. Long, that makes me feel long, <laughs> long winded answer of I concur. <laughs> yeah, long winded answer to a, a rambling, long winded question. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, we're at about halfway through. So I think it's time to swap over. Um, and our next. Next presenter will be Amy Irish Brown. She's going to be talking um, a little bit more about a different way, maybe, to address those non-compliant blocks about sort of the um, mass area-wide um, programs that have been implemented in Michigan. So Amy is currently representing her work that she did when she was part of Michigan State, I believe. So I'm not going to put too many words into your mouth, Amy. So um, go ahead. Okay, that's all right. I don't. I don't want to stop the conversation. I enjoyed listening. Um, I'm just trying to figure out where you are in the New England states compared to, or New York compared to where we are, at least with our populations for codling moth. Um, and I will say, I, I'm assuming that most of you on the call probably heard when I talked earlier um, on a meeting that Anna invited me to speak on, Phil Schwellier and I did. Um, but so I'm just going to synopsize that. I'm not going to go through all my notes in detail. However, I will. I probably should set the stage a bit on how we came to be where we are today with our cowling moth populations compared to where we were 25 or 30 years ago. So in the late 1990s, um, that's when I came to my role um, with MSU as a kind of a district integrated pest management person for tree fruits, and essentially codling moth was out of control. We were catching uh, full trap liners, and, and we were probably using the little small delta traps back then, not the big delta traps that we have now, um, but easily catching a full trap load every week. And then we learned two things. We learned that um, it was better to put the traps up higher, so we caught even more moths, and then we learned that we were probably filling up traps every night with 50 to 60 to 70 moths per trap, not every week. There just was no more surface area for them to stick to. So we had a bigger problem than I think we even realized. Um, and um, it was mainly because our, you know, traditional chemistries were no longer working and populations were getting just out of, out of control. And um, I think there was a lot of, re Reluctance to adding in mating disruption because of the cost at the time. I, again, it's 30, 25, 30 years ago, but I, I want to say it was $120 an acre or something like that. And then you still had to do your regular traditional eight spray program with a product that like azimphos methyl or glutathione that probably didn't work very well anyway, but um, you know, it was only eight or 10 bucks an acre. Um, so grow and there was also another dynamic. The prices and the market was kind of in the doghouse, very similar to where it is right now in the Apple market or where it's heading anyway. So that all that came together to not really make growers want to add on an extra, you know, hundred or so um, dollars an acre. And so one of the key things that two key things that and I mentioned this when I spoke to the grower group a few weeks ago. Um, as with all major change, sometimes we have to hit rock bottom before we really will change. And that's exactly what happened. We just could no longer control this population. And then another key event um, that kind of happened at the same time was um, our, we had a little changing of the guard in our tree fruit entomologist and Dr. Larry Goot came to us from the um, Pacific Northwest. So he brought his knowledge base of mating disruption for codling moth. Um, and uh, that it took some doing, it took him a few years and a significant grant um, to be able to move us into what we called an area-wide codling moth um, system. And so 
just quickly, the grant really helped pay for the added cost of the disruption and the added cost of the um, monitoring that was needed to make sure that, you know, if you're going to reduce your traditional chemistry spray, you better darn well make sure that there really are no moths flying around in the orchard, right? Because the traps, the scariest thing was after five or six or seven years of an area-wide project, we have growers who no longer catch any codling moth. And to not spray is just as concerning as spraying every week and not getting controls. It's kind of a odd flip on its head dynamic there, but um, so the area wide helped and the, the knowledge of how um, that needed to be done because it's interesting you're talking about non compliant blocks. That was not something we probably even, I don't remember that even being talked about at the time because the, the growing area in Northwest of Grand Rapids is a pretty large production area. It's, it's not contiguous, it's not large scale production like you would see out west. And so we had to get growers, neighboring growers to all join in and um, so that, you know, there wasn't somebody that wasn't doing disruption in the middle of everybody that was and that would get those gravid females. So that took a little bit of doing and some arm twisting and friendly neighborhood banter, but we basically got there. And some of our biggest holdouts for the area-wide project were our biggest proponents in the end once they realized it was the only way they were going to control cabin moth. Um, so, um, let's see what else is on my notes. I, I don't really have anything, the dispensers, that's interesting that, you know, isomate was what we use then. It's what you're talking about using now, Tracy, it, um, same kind of numbers. Well, I think we're, it was only it was straight up cotton moth at that time. And the, uh, the I want to say the number was 400 per acre. And so we started out at real high levels and doubled up around the borders, as you mentioned. Um, and now I think most growers that do disruption so many years later and our populations are um, very, very low, are you know, 100 to 200 dispensers is pretty common. Um, or they may use the combo as you guys mentioned. So um, I think here 25 years later and so many moths, less moths, um, there's a few things that have changed. The tree structure and the industry is very different 25 years ago, a lot more emphasis on processing market, a lot more large seedling size trees, you know, standard trees or semi-dwarf trees. Today we're doing, you know, more modern plantings, which brings some other interesting dilemmas in there as well um, on some of these um, really highly dwarfing managed um, trees, I think we end up with some hot spots sometimes because we we maybe stretch out our scouting a little too much. It's harder to scout those orchards that have a bunch of wire in between. You can't zigzag in a nice proper M pattern anymore. So um, I think sometimes we end up with some problems different because of a different orchard structure. Um, but mating disruption is still very important. And um, I also think um, we do have an interesting thing that some growers will do. They'll do mating disruption one year, and then the next year they'll take a year off and they'll go back to a more traditional program. I think they feel like if they, you know, and this, I think that only works when you're, our populations are so low and those blocks where people are doing that, they're, they're not catching more than a handful of moths in the total season. So they have extremely low pressure. Um, and I it was curious to hear the thresholds, um, Tracy, that you're using. Um, our standard threshold, and I thought that was based on work that Larry Goot did. I guess I, I went back and looked in our E154 spray guide and it just says based on, um, doesn't say where it's from. There's no resource for it, but it's listed in there. In a non-disrupted block, it's five moths. Um, per trap accumulated. So if you get over five moths, it means your population is equivalent to something that could cause, I, it, memory serves 1% um, damage, but again, that's back there in the cobwebs of the brain. So I don't know if it's true or not. Um, and um, that's standard program. If you're doing disruption, if you catch one moth and these are in one X lures, 
um, if you catch one moth, it basically means if, if then a, uh, a male could find a female. So then if you catch one moth in disruption, then you have to maybe overlay some type of a management on top of it, whether it's easy as a virus or something a little stronger as a more traditional chemistry kind of, or time something nicely with other pests that you might be going out to manage, um, making your choices that way. Um, so your choice, your numbers of two and five are different. Um, we never base our decisions here in Michigan off from a 10X lure. A 10X lure is just, we, we have those, they're in the background because after so many years of disruption, you get down to catching no collie moth. And like I said, that becomes just as unnerving as catching a hundred in a night. Um, so a 10X tells you what's going on in the background, but the 1X is what you make your decisions on. Again, because this, what I was always told um, by Larry was that they could find a 1X lure in a trap, they could find a female. Um, so now you're making me think I need to go back and review some of where all that data comes from um, or how we came to know that, I guess. Um, I'm sure that'll come out in a literature search in your SCRI grant, which is, I think, a great thing that you're doing. Um, I think, um, oh, I did want to make one comment about um, it, my experience with non-compliant blocks, because, you know, once we got this ginormous population um, brought down, everybody wanted to get involved in disruption, and that included the people with more non-compliant blocks. So um, those long skinny blocks um, and while I do think, you know, people will try it, it, it it's worked, it's not ideal, um, or they maybe need to double up around the borders. Um, but I do think in non-compliant blocks, monitoring, you know, just so that you can keep track, keep your thumb on, tra uh, on what that population might be doing, because it might not do the same thing as in a more standard, you know, nice square block. Um, that's probably more important than um, in a standardized block. So I think those are all the additional things I wanted to add. I'll answer any questions and I feel like I've talked in a little bit of a circle there. So I'm, I'm open. That's oh, great. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I moved. I moved in the meantime. Um, it's too nice out to not be outside. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing your experiences. That's really helpful. Um, I think especially, you know, we're all extension folk on here, or most of us, a lot of us are. So I think it's helpful from an extension perspective to hear sort of like what's actually boots on the ground been happening um, in Michigan. So I guess one question that I had for you is um, I can predict what my growers would do is when we were in the catastrophe stage, you know, everybody would maybe get on board with mating disruption, but then a few years down the line, and maybe they're not seeing so much damage in the fruit. And I can imagine um, some of the growers then saying, okay, I think we don't need mating disruption anymore. Um, have you seen that? Or how would you then go about kind of explaining the importance of continuing sticking with it once you're, once you're in the mating disruption program? That's a great question. And there are those that, you know, once they feel like they've got it managed. Um, but I I don't know why it is. It's not certainly, um, I don't deserve any credit for it, but I just, in when I was with Extension in our weekly meetings, it was just always a part of the conversation. You know, in if you're doing, if you're doing mating disruption or you should be doing mating disruption. You know, if you're doing mating disruption, then you don't have to worry about this pest. Or so it you just kind of always roll it into the conversation. And um there will be those people that like I said, we have this, I don't know how I, I at first when I heard growers were doing this on and off again every other year, it kind of bugged me a little bit, but I get why they're doing it. It's also depends on the producer and the time of year when they have to put up all those dispensers, you know, before bloom, they don't necessarily have a, a crew, you know, people. And now the world is very different in our labor structure with more H2A workers. Actually, I think that's helping because we're using, um, I would say probably 60% of our workforce in Michigan now is H2A labor for apples. So there's an availability of workers all the time. 
and whether a grower contracts does a contract their own or if they do a group contract, which is more popular. So if you need 10 workers to go hang disruption up for a day, you just tell your labor contractor that's what you do. So you the availability of worker, you know, hands-on type of workers is a little more nimble now, I think, than maybe it was 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Um, so that's a good thing for that because I did that was one of the big roadblocks is because it does take quite a bit of time to put up hand held um, the twist ties. Um, and it has to be done every year and it has to be done early. So, um, but I still think I haven't polled growers in a while, but just from anecdotal conversations with people, I think we're probably still at least 50% of our apple acreage are under disruption, which is pretty good. I think we were probably up to 80% at one time. So we've backed off on that a little bit. Um, but um, I do, as long as they're tracking and watching and if those numbers start popping up, um, I have very few, there's very few blocks in Michigan that catch more than 25 or 30 adult male cowling moths in a trap in a year. That's the kind of low pressure. So now there might be smaller blocks, you know, around, these are larger, you know, scale growers. Um, I, and I really should quantify that I'm speaking mainly from that main production area around Grand Rapids um, and on the west side of the state. I, there's a lot of small time production on the east side that I know a lot less about. That was a long winded answer, but it's complicated. Yeah, I think Mike had a question on the chat. I saw one at the beginning. Yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm curious how many growers on the ridge did you have to convince? I mean, I, I can think if I had to convince even five or six of mine, there'd be at least one or two holdouts. So yeah. <laughs> what was your secret? Um, peer pressure. <laughs> we, <laughs> we, um, um, in the core area, I can, I can envision it in my, I know when I go around that corner every, every day almost, and Anna knows it too, um, Fruit Ridge and 10 Mile, that was like ground zero. And um, there were probably about 20 growers-ish, 20, no more than 24 or five, kind of, that all had some land in that contiguous area. So it was a bit of an effort to get everybody on board, but, um, and we had one holdout right in the middle of it, right there at that location. And, and in the end, he ended up being our biggest, proponent um, for disruption, but it, it took a lot of hand holding and, and honestly, really, I wasn't, I said the anecdote, just kind of tongue in cheek, but it was peer pressure. Growers went and visited with them, said, hey, come on, we'll help you. You know, this is important for all of us. So kind of that, that group hug. <laughs> in sure. <a> way. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thanks. Yeah, good question. Were there any other questions or should I keep questioning? I know we've been talking about LEPs a lot, but have, have any of you also been looking at uh, dogwood borer or any of the, the peach tree borers for those of you with stone fruit? I mean, have you seen Gora, if they're adopting LEP disruption, are they also yeah. adopting these other ones or what's been your kind of, well, what have you I, been seeing? Definitely for dogwood borer, we've been using the, the um, disruption for that for quite a few years. And then, you know, a couple of years ago when Core Pyrofrost got the first ax or the second ax, I don't know what, they could keep going back and forth with that one. It, everybody jumped onto that. Um, and um, I think they have great success. People like it. It shuts the trap numbers down, shuts damage down. And um, the peach tree for um, disruption is fairly, I would say it's kind of coming along. Um, we don't have a lot of peach. I'm actually at a peach conference at the moment. Um, we don't have a lot of peach acreage in Michigan, but um, for the large scale growers, they do use it. It's pretty routine. But I, I don't think they have any other choices right now with um, chlorpyrifos being in and out all the time. Um, and I'll just back up what Amy's saying. We, and you know, with chlorpyrifos being so tenuous, and if you could even get it anyway, I mean, 
we're down to uh, you know, peach, peach tree borer, lesser peach tree borer. We see a lot of people uh, using it, um, but still, there's still room for more adoption. And dogwood borer, yeah, yeah, we see that being used too. But again, you know, with chlorpyrifos, <laughs> we may see more. <laughs> yeah, the peach tree borer is kind of has been kind of a good gateway drug uh, for our guys that you know that they. The peaches are high value enough, the plantings are small enough, and the fact that the, the that, that mating disruption seems to work on the, you know, what you would call a non-compliant block level, you know, with these tiny blocks of peaches, it seems to work pretty well. And it's gotten, I, I'd say an awful lot of people have adopted it, that adopted it, and people have been pretty happy with it up this way. And also... Oh, sorry, Amy. I'll, I'll, I was just going to say the one thing about those peach tree borer lures too is that they last a long time. That pheromone's really heavy, so you even get carryover into the next year from the previous year. And I was just going to add to talking about peaches. Um, just straight OFM disruption in peaches is pretty common here as well. It they were using that before they were doing the borers. Um, so they want. I, I can say for um, Tracy, I know they want, my growers want an American plum borer um, disruption and anything else. <laughs> so I guess if that alone tells you they're interested in the idea that they can suppress and kind of handle a population in a way that it then it's just easier to manage that when you do have a spike or something gets out of control, either the weather or whatever a, a dirty neighbor or something like that you can manage it with today's chemistry today's chemistry is not about it's not contact you know it's just it's going to work very differently so we have to manage our populations and keep them low as low as possible not just for the pest not just for the crop um, efficacy but just because if they get out of hand we'll never get it back i i, I really fear for that so uh, everything you do to their biology to confuse them is just fine with me. So definitely, I think a lot of my growers, if we um, kind of on par with what you were just saying, Amy, if we had a disruption for the 10 biggest pests um, that you could just stick it out one one thing and it would disrupt them all, you know, I think a lot more growers would be excited about adopting that. But one of the big things that I often hear, you know, is that even if we use disruption, we're still having to spray the same number of sprays in order to get those other plum curculios or maybe apple maggots or whatever else um, is showing up. So from a research standpoint, you know, we say resistance management, we say better control in case of weather, all of those things. But what do you, when you're talking with your growers, what are they saying in terms of that? Are you getting pushback of, you know, we're still spraying, so why are we using mating disruption? Or what are they, what are they saying? I heard that 25 years ago. I don't hear that so much anymore. And they do spray. I mean, they have to, apple scab requires us to spray once or twice a week, starting pretty soon. And, you know, they do that for two months. So I'm like, yeah, okay, that's just an excuse. You know, you're, they're, they're going to be out there fairly often in our neck of the woods. They got lots of diseases to contend with. So yes, you can throw in an insecticide or not throw an insecticide, but and I think disruption helps you on the latter end. It was really, um, as soon as I saw the table that was shared about OFM and the twin tube lures, I, I knew exactly what happened because that happened to us too, where the OFM, oops, we didn't read the label correctly, it runs out. Um, but that Kali moth, you know, you take care, I always tell girls, why would you not want to take care of one pest for the whole year? You 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 know, there, as long as you're keeping that population really, really low, you're you're just managing it now you have to pay attention you have to have a scout out there or someone has to be looking at traps but um that's not hard then that's not expensive so why i i think it just becomes a matter of your risk aversion and uh excuses for you know that we're humans we like to make excuses for things we don't think we want to do so um i do think that was one of the successes i can't probably emphasize enough here the importance of that ramp grant that Larry Goot got 
if it, if we didn't have that to supplement not only the cost of the the disruption, but the scouting was important as well. Um, and you know, my I guess it's probably safe to say on here there's not really growers on this call, but you know, the the level of scouting that's done is not what it should be. Um, but I get why it is what it is. But um, so that was very, very important to to get people to do the right routine scouting. Now, have they stretched that out? And yeah, of course. Um, and I keep harping on them about, you know, you have to have some OFM traps up. You have to have some lesser apple worm because one of those might rear their ugly head when you pull out all these other chemistries, you know, so it's just all about keeping track of things. But yeah, it is hard to change sometimes. My old boss actually in Michigan would always say, that's one excuse. You need three excuses to make a reason. So I'm going to start <laughs> saying that to my growers. <laughs> that's one great excuse. Now give me two more. Yeah. Well, I see Kathleen asked about um, San Jose scale. I don't know if Tracy wants to answer that. I, I just know that it's on the cusp. I don't, and I have a little bit of experience with it from research, but probably not as much as you do, Tracy. Um, are we talking about, I can't see, I don't know why oh. I can't see the chat, but, um, San Jose scale. Yeah. So mating disruption. Yeah. 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 Um, so, uh, you know, Juliana has done a lot in Apple and they've had some good trap shutdown with San Jose mating disruption and Brett Blau at university of Georgia has done the same thing in um, peaches and seen good success so far. This is going to be it, one of the topics that we would include in that project that I was describing earlier, because there's still more, um, you know, just more uh, verification and also just kind of getting at like, you know, what does it mean when your trap is shut down? Have you, have you done it? So yeah, yeah. more to come, I would say, yeah. yeah. And I would be remiss since I do work for Valent now and <laughs> we sell Esteem and Sutton Star, which are very, very good for San Jose scale. So if you if you have somebody that's not, or if you can't get the, the you know, it's brand new. So I don't know um, what the availability is, um, but yeah, there are other actually because of the Esteem being an so insect growth regulator, it comes with some very unique uh, uses. Um, I've seen some great, not and before I even work for Valent, I've seen some great uses of a couple of well-timed esteem sprays for totally wiping out a San Jose scale population. So I'll just leave that that. This is not a sales pitch. So we still have plenty of time if anybody else does have questions. Um, and if not, maybe we all have to go out there and address the fact that it's nearly silver tip already. But if there the are cold any... weather's coming, it's cold here today. Oh yeah. Yeah. Whatever happens in Michigan, I see it one day later. Mm -hmm. So that's great news. For today anyway. I'll I'll throw one more out there just while I've got the chance. Um, I, I kind of alluded to it earlier, um, but here in New Hampshire, like we, we've been working really closely with NRCS to like help them kind of determine what IPM programs under their 595 offerings they, um, they support here in New Hampshire. And they're really interested in doing more. They have record levels of funding coming in right now. And I'm just curious, you know, from this group is, is, is mating disruption, you know, and, and offering that as a practice, something that we should really be jumping on right now. You know, Amy, I hear you talking about that grant and how important that was. And this seems like, you know, it could be a similar situation in helping cover the cost of adoption. And so if we were to jump in, what would you recommend as far as the pests to disrupt right off the bat to hopefully have some good success, um, knowing that we have smaller blocks, non-compliant blocks, um, all of the above. Um, curious to get your thoughts on, on any of that. Um, you want me to handle that or does Tracy want to handle that? Or I, I, I'll start, she can chime in. Um, I have a little experience with that in Michigan 
So um, the 595 program, I totally forgot about that, um, was a part of funding for ramp and, and scouting and um, it just supplemented or it helped after the ramp grant ran out, we were able to get some funding for that for advanced uh, scouting on Orchard. So certainly um, you work with them. Um, they, I felt like the NRCS people would come to MSU. You know, they relied on us to tell them what was important and what qualified to yeah, make definitely. that relationship happen. You're, are you with the university? Yeah, with UNH yeah. Extension. Yeah. Awesome. So, um, you know, have those conversations, direct to those conversations. I think they're, I don't know how it is in your state, but here in Michigan, our NRCS, they're highly driven by row crops and probably not maybe so much for you, but they are here. Corn and soybeans rule the world and everything else just slots in. So you have to tell them what you want. Um, and those programs then, you know, can be available. So we help with, um, they would offset some, growers would get some cost share on actual scouting. So they just kept track of what their scouting cost or perceived cost, because sometimes the scouting is done by the pesticide resellers. So, it, but it has a value. Um, and then trap costs. Um, I don't think they ever could use it for any actual disruption costs, you know, because they don't usually those programs don't pay for materials, but um, like that. But perhaps it it was mainly um of the scouting. It offsets the additional scouting that was needed. Yeah. Great. Thank Great. you. I'm glad. I'm glad it's still around. Awesome. Yeah, I think I think in the new project, I think the one that Jeremy's talking about, they were paying for supplies um, for things like apple maggot and and stink bug monitoring. So, yeah, it might very well be a possibility there. I think our trouble is that our our laps are sort of very sporadic as far as whether they're really a problem for people, and it's just not on a lot of people's radar yet. And I say yet. <laughs> Do we have any other final questions for Tracy or Amy? This is your your chance for all your mating disruption questions. I'm super excited about the research that you guys are doing down there, Tracy. And if um if there's any way, I'm sure that Monique, I know that Monique is on several of those grants. So I'll I'm sure that I'll be co-opted into helping with you guys, but I'm really excited to hear what you're finding and um to hopefully help out with some of it. I think a lot of the folks on this call probably are also. Thanks, um, Janet. Yeah, definitely. If we don't have any other final questions, we do have one quick announcement that Anna wants to make before you guys disappear. Yeah, thanks, Janet. Um, I just wanted to mention that at our meeting in the fall with the Northeast Tree Fruit IPM Working Group, which is the longest acronym of any group that I work in, we had a conversation about staying in touch um, and the effort that Anna Wallingford started with trying to transfer more information from like the old guard to the next generation and how to be in touch during this season. Uh, and we kind of talked about this idea of having a weekly call just to stay in touch only for extension folks. So people working in tree fruit um, to have a conversation on a weekly basis of like what the phenology is, what the pest status is, what you're seeing, ask questions that we could give each other feedback on. And that would go to inform all of the outreach that we do to our stakeholders. Um, there's a similar model. Many of the people in this group, I think, work in berries too and are on like the weekly berry call that happens on Tuesday morning. So it would take a similar format. Um, so I'm going to coordinate that for tree fruit this year because we had sort of a consensus of interest. If you're interested in doing that, um, I'm going to send an email with a poll to try to find a time that works for folks. I don't want to conflict with that berry call, but I also want to make sure it's a time when Everyone's not in the field doing their scouting and we'll forget about it. So um, look for that email. If you want to participate in a weekly call, just fill out the poll and we'll find a time to do it. So yeah, thank you. Awesome, thank you, Anna. Um, it, sounds, it looks like Amy has one final comment to make. Is that true? I just realized I forgot to say one thing that I think is quite important. And um, I was curious to understand what Tracy might think of it. In the early nineties, we were starting to see, we were starting to have warmer summers, like all, you know, we're still talking about it and it's still a thing. Um, but we were having 
pretty routinely options for third generation cotton moth. And that was when we were under those extremely, extremely high populations. In the last 10 or 15 years, that's never a consideration anymore. And I think it's because we pushed that population so low that, you know, there's just that third generation maybe doesn't happen. And it's curious to me in the day of, you know, we just broke a record for the warmest winter. We just broke a record for the warmest February. We should be seeing a third, a third generation or a partial third generation of Cali moth by now in Michigan. And I'm not saying I want it to happen, but I'm just saying it's curious that it hasn't. And I have to believe that it has something to do with our population being so low, which is a good thing. Another benefit of disruption. Yeah, uh, Amy, we talk a lot amongst ourselves about a partial third. So here where we have high populations, you know, routinely, yeah. we do see it. Yeah. yeah, I just it's something that used to be talked about 20 years ago. And it's here in Michigan, no longer talked about. So which is a good thing. Thanks. Great. Thank you to both of you for the presentation and all of the answering questions today. I'm um, really appreciate it. Really excited to see where where mating disruption goes in the future, and um, really appreciate both of your insights on this. Um, so yeah, so this is our last conversation with the group for the year. Like Anna said, we might be doing something, um, getting together during the growing season also. So hopefully, I'll see you guys all at those conversations. Watch for that email from Anna, and please do fill out the poll. Um, and once again, really appreciate your time, Tracy and Amy. And um, I guess if anybody has any final questions or comments, you can unmute, but otherwise I'm gonna go ahead and log off. All right, thanks everyone. Have a great, great growing season. Think cold dot. Thank you.